Welcome to True Health Tuesday, and the truth will set you free. Truth is hard to come by nowadays. Okay, now, we're t- th- this, this talk today came up through a conversation I had Saturday, and I think, I think you'll find it interesting. Um, but it, if you're aware that there's more and more and more restrictions, and I don't think it's been said yet, but I really think Christmas will be canceled this year. So by, in California anyway, I mean, it'll be open in Florida, it'll be open in South Dakota and probably some, you know, free areas of the world, but not in our country. This quote should be tattooed because if you're waiting for the government to give you back the freedoms that they took, it will not happen. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. So we have to start utilizing this. Now, um, I'm going to read this, this quick little note. And this was a comment off one of our videos, and I didn't edit it or anything else. But I, I, I want to hear an amen if you've gone through something like this. Ignorance, not, not bliss. Yesterday, I filled up my car, went in to pay the man behind the elevated counter with no mask, and had two, he had two pieces of Perpex, like plexiglass, with a gap in front of him. I told him the number of the pump, and he said, you're not wearing a mask. And too tired to argue, I moved, prepared my scarf from my neck position to cover my nose like an ill bandito, shoved my card in, and done. Scarf released back to my neck, went out of there pretty darn quick. The shop was empty, so I want, I so wanted to educate him, but obviously another sheep had been watching the BBC. How many times have you gone into a gas station, be nobody there, you have your chin warmer on, and they say you don't have, you know, you can't shop here. What is the fear? What, what is that? Okay. And I'll tell you, I had a really cool experience this past Saturday night where I met someone like this and was actually able to talk to them. No, no, not, not screaming or anything. Now, half of this talk is going to be um, safe for the authorities. If I start talking about the, forget what it is. It's like an injectable medicine that is, has no long-term studies that's been rushed to market that has no liability and you shoot it in the arm and then it's going to be forced in there. And in fact, they're even going to be paying people a thousand dollars. I can't talk about that. Okay. I forget what it's called. B something. Okay. And the PowerPoints and stuff that see this information has to get out. This has to get out. Remember, Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressed. So all the freedoms that you've had taken away, all the freedom, the freedom of of no more holidays, of no traveling, of of having food restrictions, all of this stuff will not come back to you unless you take it. And the only way to take it back is with information and to convert people. And by God, that's the only place you can do it. Okay? Costs $2.97 a month. We're going to try and work a couple of contests if you can't afford three bucks a month, okay, to where, you know, we'll we'll come up with some contest or something. But get this information. This way you can get the handouts, get the the PowerPoints, get everything. Now, also, too, we've got Extreme Health Academy. This is, if you need help and support, this is the one for that. It's 20 bucks a month or $19.99. But the forums are everything. I'm on there a lot. I do question and answers about once a month for about, God, it seems like 10 hours. But this this is the key. Okay, now, literally, honest to goodness, this Saturday I was up helping a friend at her ranch. That literally is, on the picture on the left, the sunrise. That literally is on the right, the sunset. I mean, this place is magical. That center area is literally, well, I helped hang that chandelier up there. That isn't like some weird decorator thing. This is like an actual place. So um, people come over, and in the car, they're wearing the mask. And I'm warned, warned, okay, to not point fingers and laugh. And I said, no, I'm really good people with differences of opinion. (laughs) Okay, I'm not sarcastic at all, okay? I'm going to be okay. And so so it was such a trip because you had these people. I don't want to mess with the microphone. You had these people with the mask. Okay, and then they pull it down and have a sip of wine. Then they put it up. 
and then they pull it down and have a sip of wine. Then they pull it down and then they start to talk and they move it back up and then it'd slip down like this and they'd move it back up. And then after about 20 minutes or so, they took it off and, and it was such a trip because um, I, I talked to, you know, one of the two people that was there and, and you know, really non-confrontationally and explained some of this stuff. And she said, oh my gosh, you know, she talked to her partner and said, you got, I, I wish I recorded this. This was such good information. And I thought, wow, these people just don't friggin' know. So I talked to her hubby. God, it was fun. It was like verbatim from a CNN reporter. Because you know how you turn on every news channel and they're all reading from the same script and they have no content whatsoever? Okay, comes out, looking me straight in the eye and said, oh yeah, germs deadly, deadly. It just kills, okay? And the hospitals are overflowing. And in fact, the way it works is one person infects two, then two infect four, four infect eight, and then it eventually covers the whole thing. And this mask is the only way to protect you because it protects you because these particles fly out of you and people are all around you and they're all infectious. And when he finishes, honest to God, I said, you know, that's not really how the body works. And then that started a conversation. And I thought that would be of value so that you understand how the immune system works, how viruses work. So this way you can actually have a reason to be deadly panicked, but not over the virus. So when you look at one person infecting two, because we're talking about the immune system, we're two infecting four. Now this virus is supposed to have an RO factor of about two, 2.3 to be exact. So that means two, I just infected you. Now, if, if he is going to be infected, is he 100% susceptible? Has he already been exposed? If I infect every person in the front row, okay, do they all have the same immune system? So, so when you're saying one person infects two, two infect four, you're looking at 100% susceptible rate. That means that they have no good immune system, that they're actually going to allow this particle to grow in their system, that they have to be that weak. Now, why does it only infect 2.3? Oh my God, a question. A question not based in the narrative. That's because a virus has to utilize the new host, RNA or DNA, this happens to be an RNA virus, in order to reproduce itself. And then that new virus that has utilized the host RNA has to go over to another person and grow and mutate in his. It can't go to a third person because I just won't infect three. Do you know what I mean? So that would have like a little bit of a thing. And then if you're infected, do you instantly die? Or is there a recovery rate? What is the death rate to this? And so I went in and, and I, you know, told him, I said, well, that, 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 you know, one infect two, two infect four, and that's why you're going to wear the mask. Okay. I said, well, you know, let's look at immune systems. Okay. Are you aware of the Diamond Princess? And this happened back in February. We had 3,711 people on there. Okay, seven people died on the ship. And you're talking, they were quarantined. So 3,711 people, okay? You got an older population on there. Yeah, baby, this is a Petri dish. Okay, this is like beautiful. And this is back in February when nobody really knew anything. And I figure back in February and January, I was on the, all of these forums and they're trying to map the virus. Do you know what mapping the virus is or, or getting the genome of the virus? Is I take spit from you and you're supposed to be sick and coughing this up and spit from you and coughing it up. And I find similar protein things and doctors are looking around the world and they find these little protein segments that happen to be common in some, not all of them common in one person, not all of them common in the other because they haven't really isolated the whole virus. So you get these different parts of people that have similar illnesses. And then they don't really fit together. It's not like a real puzzle. So you put it in a computer and the computer adds stuff to make you a really pretty picture. Yeah. Okay, so that's how you're looking for this infectious virus. And then we're gonna get into the testing a little bit, but out of this group, the 3,711, they found out around 
had an immune system response or had some type of reaction. In the 70 to 79 group, six people had died. In the 80 to 89 group, one person had died. So out of this whole group, 3,711, and a lot of them elderly, seven people had died. Now, you might think, well, what about the 3,704 people that didn't die? Okay, that would be a good question. You know, and the quality of life literally depends on the quality of questions you ask. So I mentioned this to the guy, and I said, this was enclosed, they're eating the same food, breathing the same air. So what was the factor? Okay, what was the factor? It was the immune system. Then I mentioned the 1918 study that took 100 healthy Navy guys and they wanted to find out how this infectious worked. So they decided to find out, and they isolated this bacilla, and that, that they found, again, not in 100% of the people, because how are you gonna find the same protein if it's gonna utilize your RNA, and then your RNA, and then your RNA, and then your RNA? It's gonna be changing a little bit. And then each protein that we swab, we're not gonna look at the strip of DNA and just, just decipher it, no. You gotta take a, the swab and the sputum and try and grow something that matches. Okay, so there's a challenge there. I know, I know. The TV doesn't exactly tell you there's a challenge there. Okay, so, so back here in 1918, now you're looking at 100 healthy Navy guys. So these are guys, nothing but 100% organic, very few vaccines, almost no medication. So they take this bacillus, put it up their nose, put it down their throat and rub it in their eyes. Not one of them got sick. So then they think, wait a second, that doesn't make sense. So then they take sputum from a bunch of people and then shove it up their nose, shove it in their eyes, shove it down their throat. Not one of them got sick again. And you think, well, wait a second. Next, some volunteers received injections of blood from influenza patients. Still, they didn't do it. Next, the they didn't catch, catch a cold. The volunteers were taken into an influenza ward. And by the way, if you have a bunch of people that are sick and some a little bit sick, some of a lot sick, if you really want to spread a disease, you put them in a giant room called a ward. That way they can all spread the disease really nicely. You don't want to like isolate them and treat them individually. Yeah, we still haven't learned that. Okay, then they were exposed to 10 patients each, had the patients cough directly in their face, talk to them, and shake their hands. And yes, not one of them got sick. We entered the outbreak with the notion that we knew the cause of disease. We were quite sure we knew how it was transmitted from person to person. If we, perhaps if we've learned anything, it is that we are not quite sure about what we know about the disease. Absolutely. Now we have the World Health Organization saying um, back in June, from the data, we, it still seems that it was rare that an asymptomatic person actually transmit onward to a secondary individual. So we do have something causing the world to change the way they're doing, something that's restricting your lifestyle, your business, causing gonna be worldwide famine, causing worldwide economic depression. So there is something out there. Now you, you might be sarcastic and say it's so deadly they have to test you to make sure that you have it, okay? Or it has a recovery rate of over 99%. Again, this is just you know for asymptomatic people. It, it's rare. Now, the virus experts, okay, now th this one, the great God Fauci. Now I know he's, you know, part of Moderna. I know he's, you know, been in, in business. I mean, in the government for 40 some years. In all the history of respiratory viruses, asymptomatic transmission has never been the driver of outbreaks. An epidemic is not driven by asymptomatic carriers. I'm actually gonna show you how this is true and why they're doing this. See, back then in 1918, uh, on the same time, they didn't know much about how the virus was transferred. Obviously, we didn't learn anything from them, okay? And they didn't know much about aspirin. And in fact, they were giving handfuls of aspirin. They didn't know that, I mean, aspirin would reduce the fever. Now we know that fevers are actually good, that it elevates your immune system response. They didn't know that the aspirin would cause hemorrhagic disease or bleeding in the lungs and kidneys. And they didn't know that there was a limit to the amount of aspirin you could take. Um, in 1918, the Surgeon General, the U.S. Navy, in, and the Journal of Medical, uh, American Medical Association um, <laughs> recommended uh, salicylates or aspirin. If these recommendations were followed if, and if pulmonary edema occurred in only 3% of the persons, a significant portion of the deaths may be attributed to aspirin. 
So really, so even at 1918, they didn't know. So what we're looking at, and this is hugely important, and this is where everyone is, is masking and frightened, okay? There is no social distancing here. You can come in and sit down, okay? Just, I don't know. He's looking a little peaked. She looks kind of cool. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Okay, the quality of your life depends on this question. Is it the virus that infects you, or is it that you have sick tissue and a pathogen grows in it? Is it the virus that affects you, okay, or that affects everybody, or is it that you have sick tissue and that's where the virus grows? Now, now again, you got to think about this because if you have that dreaded fear, and this is what I was trying to explain to that guy on Saturday night, Pasteur and Beauchamp had this big discussion. We're still having it today, but since there's very few pharmaceutical products that actually strengthen your immune system response to the environment, that's not promoted. But fighting the disease, fight it, fight it, okay? The, instead of strengthening the immune system. How many times have you heard, you know, take vitamin C, vitamin D? In fact, if you recommend vitamin therapy to strengthen your immune system, bam, that's one of the ministry of truth. They'll kick you off. So this is fact. And, and this is what I'll tell patients who are going through a chronic injury, illness, or disease. And they'll say, well, you know, should I get this test? Should I get this test? Should I get this? this? And I'll say, anything that you do that helps your immune system is good. Anything you do that weakens your immune system is bad. Okay? Is that too complex? Okay? I think it's pretty true because people, when they're going through chronic illness, disease, cancer therapy, and they're doing everything, and this is basically it. The stuff that you do that's toxic and deficient weakens your immune system. The stuff that you do that's good for you elevates your immune system. This is why I'm not a fan of the cut, burn, and, and poison. Um, approach to cancers, considering that's usually an adaptation to a toxic and deficient environment. So anything you do that weakens your immune system is not good. Anything you do that strengthens it is good. Okay? Does that make sense? And this is how your gut, brain, and mind are in your immune system. Things that weaken the immune system, physical, chemical, emotional stress, medications weaken the immune system, nutrient deficiencies weaken it, sedentary lifestyle weakens it, and fatigue, lack of sleep weakens it. What kind of stuff helps your immune system? Healthy stress. You need stress. Good God, you need stress. Eliminate the reason for medication. So if you're taking a drug, find out why you're taking it. Okay, I mean, it's, it's, it seems too simple, but we just got, you know, every day we're getting patients that are taking some medication. And, and every week we're getting one or two autistic patients, which is horrible because you hear the same, same story but we can't talk about that because the Ministry of Truth will knock us out. Um, nutrient sufficiencies. Yes, the Ministry of Truth, we can't talk about vitamin C. That's where we're going to shut this, this talk off halfway. Or vitamin D. But look at some of the sites that still recommend it, that still do the studies. When, and again, this is out of the Journal of Vaccine and Vaccinology, or Vaccines and Vaccination. Antoine Beauchamp and Pasteur. The, the germ is what you have to be afraid of, or your immune system, whether it's strong or weak, is what you have to be concerned with and focus on. Okay, what makes sense to you? There's no medical doctrine as potentially dangerous as partial truth implemented as the whole truth. Welcome to 2020. Any medical professional, bioscientist, or healthcare practitioner, or layperson for that matter, who wishes to gain insight into the origins and nature of infectious and chronic illness and disease against the backdrop of a marvelous view of the life process must consider Beauchamp. Absolutely. I mean, if we look back at the diseases that, that modern science is saying that they've eradicated. Polio, 1955. What was the death rate from that? If you ask people today, everybody was dying. Auditoriums full of iron lung. Not really you had a 99.999% chance of not dying from them. Okay, one in 100,000. So what was the impetus behind this? If, if you're curious, and again, I brought this up Saturday night when I was talking to my new friend 
Okay, and I said, how about looking at the book Dissolving Illusion, okay, by Susan Humphreys. I mean, brilliant. They talk about polio, smallpox, amazing. But when you're looking at measles, pertussis, tetanus, mumps, you know, one in 100,000, one in 50,000, one in 500,000, you know, and everything is a 99.99, okay, a chance of not dying from. So is it, if you've got one in 1,000, that means 999 people did not die. Should you treat everybody that thousand and just hope that the side effects of your therapy are not that good, not that bad? Or should you look at that one person that died and find out what they were they deficient or toxic with? What makes more sense? The quality of questions you ask, it directly equate to the quality of your life. Did you know that viruses aren't alive? That they're well-organized molecular parasites? And when we talk about the replication of the current test that, that's being done so that, that you can be safe or you're infective or, you know, whatever. Okay, we're going to cover that when we, have, when we shut this down or go to the private site. It's not a living organism. It's a well-organized molecular parasite. It cannot reproduce on its own. Lancet. The germ theory has become dogma. It neglects many of the other factors that play a part in deciding whether the host germ environment complex lead to infection, genetic condition, behavior, socioeconomic determinants. How would you like to have lost your job, have multiple kids, and be in this environment? Does that help your immune system or weaken your immune system? What kind of equipment do you need to live in our planet? Well, if you're afraid of the germs, you should be covering yourself in saran wrap. Okay, you got to leave a couple of holes open because you do need oxygen. Okay, do, do, do you understand? Is this based in science or is it based in fear and ignorance? I mean, we have great science right there, you know, when germs were coming from bad air. Okay, although how many times if you've been walking around a sidewalk without a mask, when you walk close, they pull up the mask. Have you ever experienced that or is I'm, am I the only one that... Okay, so what's the idea from that? What's the idea? They're thinking that there's air everywhere that's bad around you? That was the 1300s. That's why you fill that snout with herbs. Okay, that people are just spreading droplets everywhere? Well, here's the thing. Nitric oxide, this is breathing in and out through your nose. Okay, is this important? Well, it lowers your blood pressure, increases oxygen absorption, kills bacteria, Viruses and boost your immune system. Does the mask help you or are you rebreathing toxic products in? And what did they say? They say, well, it doesn't lower your oxygen. Okay, good. Show me a long term study, okay, like they did in Denmark, of people that have worn a mask for a month and people that didn't wear a mask for a month. And let's see if they're healthy or not. Because we've been wearing this crap for about eight months, okay? And, and what? Well, oh, no, no, you're right. It was only two weeks. Okay, March 24th, yeah, two weeks just to flatten the curve, just to eve the stress on the hospitals. Eve, there wasn't any stress at the time, but they were planning it. Now, advice on masks according to the World Health Organization. There is limited evidence wearing a medical mask by healthy individuals. Healthy individuals, healthy individuals. Remember, is the germ that causes the disease or is it the weakened tissue that causes the susceptibility? Keep repeating that over and over. Um, however, there's currently no evidence that wearing a mask, whether medical or other types by healthy person in a wider community setting, including universal community masking, can prevent them from infection or respiratory viruses, including COVID-19. If you look at the box where the blue mask, and by the way, look at the blue mask clearly, they do have flame retardant in there, so you're breathing in a cancer-causing agent, plus you're limiting it. So if you put it below your nose and try to breathe slowly, solely through your nose to help your nitric oxide production, which you know helps your immune system, okay, fantastic. If somebody says, put it over your nose, uh, you can say it won't fit. You, you're, you got a small nose. Okay, I could get away with it not fitting. Okay, this is a study in Korea, in, in uh, South Korea. What was interesting, they took four people who tested positive and <laughs> they're coughing up and everything. So they put a surgical mask on, coughed in a dish. Paper mask on, coughed in a dish. And no mask and coughed in a dish. Okay, and they did this in a, in a negative pressure air room. And they found out, oh my gosh. 
Um, they were instructed to cost five times. Interestingly, they didn't. Um, the swabs from the outside of the mask were tested positive for car, uh, SARS COVID 2, while most of the swabs in the inside of the mask were negative. Isn't that interesting? Now, they didn't stop the virus, they would still hit everywhere. And it's, it's pretty easy. If you, if you want to do an experiment, you know, eat an onion, put the mask on, and see if somebody can smell it. Okay. I think the, the olfactory particles from the onion are pretty much bigger than the virus. So, you know, just that'll freak you out. But why would it be on the outside? Well, your immune system actually works. And if you're breathing, you're breathing out air probably about 70 to 90 degrees because it's been heated up by your blood. This virus has, happens to die at around 80 degrees. But why is it on the outside? Because you're always touching it. So you have this cloth, and some people wear it for, for weeks. What about lockdown? We just had our emperor in California decide that there is now a, um, a what, what's the restriction on time? Okay, a curfew. Okay, a curfew now. Where's the data for that? No, you don't need it when you're emperor. Data, little girl, is not for you. I will just decide what's better for you. No, seriously. Okay, and there's demonstrations in Huntington Beach if you want to go to it. They're usually every Saturday, but I'm not here in sat on Saturday, and I can't stay up past 10 because I'm usually asleep. But here you go. We in the World Health Organization do not advocate lockdowns as primary means of control of the virus. And this is what was said. This is October 14th that came out with it. But what did they tell you back in March 24th? That the, the only time we believe a lockdown is justified is to buy time to reorganize, regroup, and rebalance your resources to protect the health of your workers who are exhausted, but by large, we'd rather not do it. Is everybody real, just stressed out to the max? Hospitals are packed. People are dying in the streets. Or do we have a case demic? Well, we know that the lockdowns are going to contribute to about a million deaths next year in deaths of despair. We know that the UN warned that there are going to be hundreds of thousands of children dying, okay, from these restrictions. And they are not, I don't think, considering it, it's just economic hardship. They're not talking about the worldwide famine. What do you do? What do you do to strengthen your immune system? It's basic. Look at your physical stress. How do you assess that? Look at your activities during the day. A digital x-ray is a good idea. Um, movement. If you're sedentary lifestyle, get up and start moving. Breathing. Just if you look at the Wim Hof breathing method, if you just sat down there, if you're quadriplegic and you can't move, deep breathe. That will help oxygenate your system and calm it down. Emotional stress. Okay, look at neuro linguistic programming, NLP. We do that. Look at, look at eye movement desensitization response. Look at emotional freedom technique. There's tons of therapies that you can do to change how your brain works. If you know anxiety, stress, and depression are located in the frontal lobe, and the cerebellum on the back controls the frontal lobe, so this means symmetrical movement. So what do we recommend? Deep breathing and walking in the grass. It works. Okay? Chemical stress. If you're taking drugs, find out why you're taking them. Okay? Because honestly, I mean, just got another patient in a day. A couple of high blood pressure medications, a few antidepressants, a bunch of stuff going on. And I said, look. If you and me were left alone on a desert island, you had no access to pharmaceuticals, you only had fresh fruit, fresh water, and fresh fish, um, would your health improve or decline? What do 100% of people say when I ask that? They say, wow, doc, it improved. Once I had somebody say, well, it'd probably get better. <laughs> we already know. We already know this stuff. We have the sickest animal species as a population in the planet. Half of our population will develop some type of cancer. Half. If I said there's a herd of cattle that have one in five had an autoimmune disease, half of them are going to die of cancer. One in four has heart disease, liver disease, depression, dementia, thyroid problems. This is a herd of animals. You want to get a burger from that herd? No, it's sick. Okay, but it's sick. Is it sick because they're genetic, defective? Or is it because they're toxic and deficient? Western-based diets. Okay, now this is huge. 
Western-based diets, the standard American diet, the SAD diet, contributes West obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, um, problems with fats, osteoporosis, bowel disorders, inflammatory autoimmune diseases, and several cancers, all from the diet. Why do we do full body thermographies and everything on everybody here so that we can identify toxins in the body? It works. Do we identify some cancers? Yeah. And then we give them the options. You can detox, find the source of it, strengthen the immune system, or go the standard route, the cut, burn, and poison. Did you know? I mean, right now they're saying 200,000, no, 250,000 people. And then the CDC comes out and say, well, their number is about 94% off. That's a, there's a difference from dying with a disease. That means that you have comorbid conditions like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, chemotherapy, all the other stuff, and or dying from this. Now we know healthy people are not dying from this. You have to have some type of weakened immune system in order to affect it. And then, you know, somebody is going to text me and say, oh no, in Australia, there was a 35-year-old guy. Okay, yeah, let's find out how accurate was the test. Did he really have it? What was his lifestyle like? You know, was he healthy with no medications, but he was 400 pound smoker that had no lifestyle? You know, I mean, come on. You know, let's look at human beings. The right drug given for the right diagnosis in the right dosage kills 128,000 people minimum a year. Five times more, and this is our drug, drug overdose. Okay, these are the right drug at the right time. Okay. Cholesterol drugs, damage the mi gut microbiome. This is 80% of your immune system. Cholesterol is 50% of the overall weight of the brain. Cholesterol is the precursor, what the building product that you use for every hormone that you make, for every glucocorticosteroid, minocorticosteroid, and sex hormone. And it is elevated in anyone that has inflammation and tissue damage. non anti-inflammatories. This is Advil, Motrin, Aleve. It's not Tylenol because nobody knows how that one works, okay? Um, gastrointestinal bleeding, again, gut dysfunction. Increased blood pressure, no problem, we got drugs for that, okay? Accelerates thinning of the bones, no problem, we got drugs for that. Decreased production of, of blood cells, no problem, we got drugs for that. Proton pump inhibitors, this is the antacid that actually destroys your ability to break down nutrients. Okay, it's supposed to be for reflux. The problem with reflux, oh, good God. Okay, okay, can you bring the dog here just so people can see this? Okay, you have got, you're going to be on YouTube, okay? Okay, okay, hold the dog up there. There's the camera. Okay. Dad, oh, my God. Okay, here you go. No, 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 no. no, no I, I won't give him back. I'll just keep him. <laughs> wow. Sarah, do not look at that dog. We are not going to get one yet. Okay, proton pump inhibitors. I mean, the, the theory is that antacids, okay, that, that reflux comes from too much acid. The opposite is true. It's too little acid. Um, Non-antibiotic drugs affect the gut bacteria, and this is almost every kind of drug you can get out there. Polypharmacy, the average person over 65 is taking seven different drugs every day. As, as, have you seen with the, the interaction between the proton pump inhibitor, the beta blocker, and the uh, ACE inhibitor? No, there is no study on that. And the doctors don't tell you to separate them because it's just ridiculous. What about the glyphosates in the food? This destroys your gut flora. This is an additive on every grain product that's not organic. It's carcinogenic. It leads to cancer. How, what, what happens if you don't regulate this stuff in a population? You have a one in two chance of getting cancer. That's 50%. That's ridiculous. Okay, increased permeability. Do we have neurologic disorders now? Yeah, 54% of our kids have a chronic illness or injury. 60% of our adults have it. Okay, we're not even talking the mental disorders that are going to develop from kids not being able to see others, to interact, to have, have fun time in school. So this is your immune system. You have a nervous system that regulates it. You have a fight or flight system or a rest and digest. You've got a sympathetic and parasympathetic. If you are chronically stressed, 
like you're watching CNN and you have no clue at immune system function, you're going to be in a sympathetic dominant state. What that sympathetic dominant state does is it shuts blood supply down to the gut. And that physical, chemical, and emotional stress keep you in that sympathetic dominant state. In order to heal your body, you got to heal the gut. You're going to get that parasympathetic. So what do you do? You look at the physical, chemical, and emotional stressors. What does the CDC tell you? They say, look, the way to help your body is to increase physical activity, have a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, maintain social engagement, and participate in intellectually stimulating activities. If you don't do that, if you're using medications, the thing that weaken your immune system, medications, nutritional deficiencies, infection, poisoning, brain tumors, and oxia, and hypoxia, hypoxia. What's hypoxia? Oh, that's less oxygen. No problem. I'm going to stop spitting on people. You have the second brain, the enteric brain. Anything you do to the gut affects this. This is why we talk about fermented foods. It's so hugely important. Recent studies demonstrated that probiotic bacteria have benefic beneficial effects in these diseases by effectively improving the intestinal barrier function. How many people have a leaky gut that we see on x-ray? I mean, we're looking at like 30, 40%. And, and, you know, they're coming in with all different kinds of diseases, which are really not diseases. They're adaptations to chronic stress. And so people, I mean, get people all the time. Well, you know, this is different than my doctor who's managing my type 2 diabetes. I say, yeah, I don't want to manage it. I just want to fix it. Okay. I mean, exercise, it increases blood vessel formation. It's good for you. Yes, you're right. We should close the gyms. Why? Where's the scientific data on that? How stupid. Look at other states that don't close the gyms. It's ridiculous. So now, the tough part is the slide after this. If the science and data do not support the COVID response, why are the restrictions in place? If the science and data do not support the COVID restrictions, why? Are the restrictions in place? I'm going to answer that. You can imagine because we're going to talk about a couple of things um, that that will be wiped out. I really don't know how long we're going to have the YouTube channel on or Facebook, um, but that's why you've got to go to Dr. B V I P. It won't be put up there now, but it'll be put up in a week. But we've got to keep this information isolated. But when you get on there, you click on the slide. You'll be able to highlight it, put it in your browser get the information and disseminate it. Be part of the revolution. Do not be part of the problem. Those people that go along without questioning are, are the tide. We can turn that, but it requires information, education, and a change in perception. If you feel that you're weak and not designed to live here and you're sick, okay, I totally get it, but you're not. You're, you're made in the image and likeness of God. You are more energy than matter. You are the end of, the, of, of multiple generations of people that have survived. Northern European, yeah, baby, you survived the plague. Okay, of course, if you had good medical insurance at the time of the plague, you died faster because they did a bleeding and mercury injection. But, you know, peasants kind of that didn't have a shitload of sanitation, they lived really well, okay? But, you know, let's not talk about that because that's the hygiene hypothesis. We've got to change this perception. You, you have a voice. You can be heard. Don't just acquiesce. Okay, does that make sense?